What is happening out there, Roto Scouts baseball fans? Surprise, gang! Saturday show. I know I said I wasn't going to do one as we were winding things down yesterday, but this slate looks too interesting. Hopefully some people trickle in over the next few minutes. No, it was a little bit of a pop-up. Looks like we've got Poe DJ and Stoner in the chat. Appreciate you, buddy. Baseball and bong rip season for Poe DJ. Gotta love it. Had some other folks in the Discord clamoring for a show, but uh, like I said, I wasn't planning on doing this. I'm not going to do no promises for Saturday shows, no promises for Sunday shows. Got a little pet hair on the top of my head there. Going forward, um, especially Saturdays, my ticket package for the Yanks is Saturday afternoons for the most part, every Saturday home game. So I don't want to get in the habit of doing these, but uh, wanted to jump on today for one too many misses last night. Just didn't like last night's results with the uh, particularly I judge a lot of it by the pitchers and got a lot of it right. But had a couple misses, too conservative on Nick Pavetta, too conservative on uh, Bobby Miller, who I love, but was just kind of hedging my bets on last night. And both those guys just came out with monster days. So that pissed me off a little bit. But we nailed the A.J. Puck thing. Logan Allen didn't quite come through for us, but Kyle Harrison basically got there. Could have been a little bit sharper. But overall, I just wasn't too thrilled with yesterday. So I figured jump on. There's a lot of stuff to talk about. Full content up on the site for today. We've got uh, some split action, right? So we've got a nine-game full-blown uh, slate during the afternoon starting at 140 on DraftKings. That's all punched up. That's up on the site right now. DraftKings went, went with a uh, split 50K in the afternoon, 50K in the evening. FanDuel just made the evening their main slate. And they split up the afternoon in a really stupid way. So FanDuel, um, for the nine games that we're going to be talking about right now, FanDuel's got a two-game slate for the two 1 o'clock games, the, or excuse me, the 140 and the 210 game. And then they've got a separate seven-game slate for the seven games in the 4 p.m. hour. So that's kind of annoying. Nobody's really happy about that, myself included. This is mostly, I mean, we'll talk all through, all the plays are, going to be right in front of you and they're going to be you know we'll i'll talk about the fan duel pricing but it's kind of a DraftKings oriented show in terms of they've got that full nine game slate so everything is in the same place at the same time um but there's a lot to talk about i think it's a really interesting looking slate i called out a few things already in the chat but if you're going to the site we've got uh, full hitter projections i just updated for the confirmed lineups for the two early games we've got all four teams confirmed lineups in for the one o'clock game and the two o'clock game so that's a plus um i'll confer i'll update you know the other ones as we go hopefully we get a couple of them uh, before the slate locks at 140 um pitcher projections are all fully up to speed i just punched up a full uh, nine games of uh, notes the strategy article the notes just in bullet point form again try and make it a little bit easier to get through um so went through uh went through all of that up on the site the top stacks tool, which I made sure to go through and make sure everything made sense because of the way those averages work. I didn't really like where like the Diamondbacks were yesterday in just the raw averages. So I just moved them up the board manually a little bit later in the afternoon. Um, and obviously they ended up coming through. So I put a little bit of subjectivity into that. What I'm going to do with that tool going forward as soon as I get up to speed with the uh, Ace Mind Sims is just I'm going to use that for the Sim repository, right? I'm going to run Sims and I'm going to give you guys the uh, the top percentages kind of like we do with basketball. That's what the top stack tool will become. Uh, it'll be kind of uh, like the boom bust over at uh, Stochastic was, you know, with all percentage-based uh, stuff. It's a little bit better than just doing like the raw averages of those players, uh of those players uh, totals and everything so that that tool will improve we've got the home run picks are up on the site uh and we've got the well, whatever else is up there whatever you can find it's all up there it's all for free right now go check it out if you get a chance follow the at roto scouts twitter handle like and retweet anything that you see pop up so that we can just get more and more friends in here and keep this thing rolling so one of the key talking points of the entire slate one of the really interesting things is right here in front of us in this first game, the uh, Brewers at the Mets. And that, of course, is uh, Zach Short hitting eighth for the Mets. Uh, excuse me, I mean, that's D.L. Hall pitching for the Brewers. Of course, it's D.L. Hall pitching for the Brewers. Uh, D.L. Hall, kind of an interesting pitching prospect just on his own, just in a vacuum. Um, and DraftKings did us the favor of pricing him at just 4600 today for his first start in the show. So that's kind of fun. Gives us a really easy go-to SP2 option. Um, you could go double cheap 
I wouldn't do it with these with Luis Severino as the second starter. But you could book two cheap starters on this slate fairly easily. There's a lot of reasonable guys in like the sevens kind of territory. And then D.L. Hall at the $4,600 mark. I assume he's going to be super chalky. People, he's no secret. Actually, let me check the projected ownership on him. Let's see. Maybe he is a secret. Looks like we got somebody's lineup. Now, of course, right after I update and start the show, the Orioles, the Royals, and the Reds lineups dropped. It's annoying. Uh, well, if this is correct, <laughs> there's like no ownership on him. Um, I'm really curious. If anybody has a, uh, just give me an indicator as like high owned, low owned. Uh, if anybody's looking at ownership projections, not from uh, Roto Grinders. Roto Grinders, Roto Grinders has them in the low single digits on DraftKings. I don't buy that for a second. Not at forty six hundred. The kids, he's been hyped through a lot of the industry and uh, through the through a lot of the spring. He pitched in relief a little bit last year, 19 and a third innings, 28.4% strikeout rate as dynamite, a 3.26 ERA, 3-1-1 XFIP in that role. We'll probably see higher run totals, but I think the strikeouts are realistic. A 13.7% swing, swinging strike rate is a really good indicator that he'll be able to sustain that success. He was great at avoiding uh, premium contact, didn't allow too many home runs in the relief role. Really like the spot. This kid was the, you know, the prized... Uh, piece of the uh, Corbin Burns trade so there's there's clear upside here he's a highly highly regarded pitching prospect left-hander it's going up against a reasonably talented Mets lineup but I mean it's not the greatest lineup in the world like you know they've got Tyrone Taylor hitting cleanup today Tyrone Taylor's good against lefties he does have a little bit of pop but it's more like cheap DFS pop right 2400 on FanDuel 2900 on DraftKings there's reason to talk about Tyrone Taylor from a DFS perspective but He's a part-time major leaguer. He's not a full starter. Brendan Nimmo's a great leadoff hitter. Lindor, Pete Alonso, obviously, you know, two stars at the top of the lineup. There's difficult parts of this lineup for DL Hall to work through. But at the $4,600 price, even if he only goes a few innings, I think it's going to be fairly easy for him to at least make value. And I think he's got a pretty significant ceiling on there. Um and I have no real indicators that he's only going to go, you know, short innings. I think he's, you know, he's a, he's a big part of their rotation. So I, I'm expecting a full first start of the year, first MLB start. But I'm expecting him to be, you know, basically fully unleashed here. So I really like that spot. I think that's a killer, killer value in this first game on deck. Let me say hi to everybody. I kind of just jumped in. Stephen B's here. Gilbert Powell's here. Anthony Taylor. Ducking. Ducking said, ah, an early show. Let me get my book. Lazy mofos. The judge showed us shit is nasty. I can't even hate it. It's fun as hell to see. I'm happy for y'all. I'm happy for me too. I'm happy for the Yankees. Got to get Judgey engaged in the season. Judgey's left a uh, a small city on the bases so far, and he's grounded into like three, I think, rally killing double plays. But I have no doubt in my mind that uh, Judge will get going. And yeah, Soto's just started right where we wanted him, and the power's gonna come. It was great yesterday. He check swing. Went off the left field wall in uh, in Houston, uh, way up that high wall that they've got in left too, and uh, Ster- John Sterling just you know totally missed the call as usual. Pretty funny. It was cool though. I uh, learned that on that Apple broadcast, you can switch to the local radio feed, which is great. Um, local radio feed for the Yankees is John Sterling and Susan uh, Susan Waldman, who you know some people like, some people don't like. I'm I come down kind of in the middle with them, um, but. It's better, shockingly, than the two guys who were doing that game for Apple. They were awful. So if you're watching on Apple, you flip to the settings, settings, audio, and you can get either team's uh, local radio feed. Jeff Hutchins made 144 bucks on DraftKings pick six last night. Beautiful. Love to hear that. Uh, Art Jones, it's a, it's a fair point. I didn't think about the rain. What's, uh, what's going on rain-wise? It's by the way, it's uh, looking out my window. It is a gorgeously sunny day right now, so that hadn't been on my uh, on my radar. But uh, I'll pull up Mr. Roth. As usual, I don't. Uh, I am not a weatherman, and I don't really love speculating about uh, the rain outside of just 
relying on the experts. Kevin Roth, at Kevin Roth WX, has always been good for weather, uh, at least for covering the initial stuff. Doesn't look like he's got a ton out here. Let's see. Ah, oh, there we go. I'll just go over to RG for his pre, his full thing. Um, Windy, but no... He's got it green. No threat of rain in uh, in New York. First two games, uh, green per, per Mr. Roth here. He's got a little bit of warning in Baltimore. A little bit in Philly. So maybe it's just the same rain that you're seeing, but it's not going to get to New York in uh, in time to mess up these games. Maybe in, in the night slate. But Baltimore and Philly, you know, obviously same track, just a little further south, do have a little bit of warning. So looks like we could get wet in those two games, potentially out in Oakland again. Um, but he's saying it looks better, and they did play last night after the ridiculous rainstorm they had. Cincinnati is, you know, a little uh, Cincinnati-ish. And then uh, San Diego and Los Angeles both look like they've actually got some weather in the area too, which is odd for those two towns. But... Like I said, just keep an eye on whatever Roth is saying, and you'll be right as rain. Oh, boy, that was dumb. I did not mean to say that. <laughs> right as rain, jackass. Um, does look like we've got some wind, again, blowing out to right field in the uh, Mets game, and then a little bit out to center in Chicago. Nice sunny days in both, though. Sunny and warm. Warm for March. And again, that was all per uh, Kevin Roth. And his uh, weather report, which is over at uh, Roto Grinders. He also tweets. I usually go by his tweets, but he didn't have information in his tweets. So I had to go to the report on Roto Grinders. Anyway. So, DL Hall, 4,600. You can see it's a very strong projection for him. I'm giving him, again, full innings. Not going to be uh, not gonna be hesitant to do that here. Um, I do think you can roster the Mets on the other side of that one. There is certainly power upside. Pete Alonso over the magic number at a 12.76 for home run potential today. He knocked 46 long balls last year, 287 ISO, 121 WRC+. Plus. He hits behind Francisco Lindor. Lindor went 31-31 last year. That's a dynamite season for anybody. Shortstop, that's a killer season. 216 ISO, 121 WRC+. Plus. Brendan Nimmo at the top of their lineup. Very, very good leadoff hitter, 274, 363, 466 last year. Creator runs 30% better than average. Also hit 20 home runs of his own, or excuse me, 24 home runs of his own, 47.5% uh, hard hit rate. So I really like the three men off the top for the Mets, but then it trails off really quickly. Like I said, Tyrone Taylor, DFS-wise, yeah, there is sneaky home run potential, especially against the lefty there, and obviously that is real baseball-wise too, but he's not exactly a major threat it's not even francisco alvarez in all his power there he drops down to the seven spot in the lineup he loses he was over the magic number when he was uh hitting fourth in the initial projected lineup but at 8.91 he takes a little bit of a haircut loses a you know portion of a plate appearance in projections starling Marte has a lot of veteran know-how i do like him for a bounce back season you know 12 home runs 30 plus stolen bases seems realistic he hit five home runs last year in 341 plate appearances. He went 248, 301, 324. Creator runs 24% worse than average. His ISO was .076. Just wasn't driving the ball at all last year when he was healthy and on the field, and he was rarely healthy and on the field. Managed to steal 24 bases. Has a little bit of value based on that, 2,700, 3,600. If you're stacking Mets, I wouldn't avoid him, but it's another player that I'm not really considering much of a threat to the DL Hall upside. Jeff McNeil, similar Babbit based batting average on balls in play for the uninitiated. Babbit based slap hitting type of a player. Only went 270, 333, 378 last year. Crater runs exactly at league average. Didn't get on base nearly as much as he needs to. Didn't come up with as many stolen bases as he could because his Babbit was weaker last year than it's been. The years where he's hit over 300, he's had a fantastic Babbit. He's always supported by that. Um, and he lives and dies by that. Alvarez, like I said, tons and tons of power potential, but also a fair amount of strikeouts, 26% last year, and pretty gettable. Just 209, 284 in the front end of the triple slash is not good. Even for a catcher, not good. When it's a catcher hitting as many home runs and hitting for as much premium contact as he does, you'll tolerate it. And he's a, he was a rookie last year, so you tolerate it, of course. But he's a non outside of the occasional home run, he's a kind of non threatening hitter. 97 WRC plus last year. Did have a 228 ISO. Certainly drives the ball well. 
But between the strikeouts and uh, you know just the lack of putting the ball in play for any kind of hits, there's not a ton of threat there. Zach Short, Harrison Bader, nobody's really frightened of those players. So you know, we're talking about three real threats at the top of the lineup and then kind of a mixed bag the rest of the way. I like the spot for DL Hall. I really do. On the other and and the price just forty six hundred, like it's it's just a no brainer. Sixty one on Fanduel is a little bit more difficult. It is still very very cheap. I still would use it, uh, but I just question his depth of start. I question whether he can get to that quality start bonus that we probably on this slate will need. So I don't love it on uh, on Fanduel. I absolutely love it at forty six hundred as an SP two on DraftKings. Christopher says, good start to the season for new playing chalk. For now playing chalk, going to ride the chalk wave till it fails. Yeah, look, there's chalk is chalk for a reason. I've always said that, and uh, it's it's just been the most overblown thing in uh, DFS for years, the individual ownership. And, you know, for baseball, it's obviously the popularity of the overall stack. But there are always ways to make a stack more unique. There's always ways to put it together with something else that is totally unique. Use a different pitcher. There's there's so many things you can do with this many lineup spots that, yeah, I, I just really don't sweat popularity that much. On the other side for the Mets, I got to keep in mind that we've got a 140 start that I'm up against here, so I do have to keep talking. Uh, on the other side for the Mets, Luis Severino, um, a talented guy who just misses way too much time and didn't have a good year when he pitched last year. Two years ago, in his 102 innings, 19 starts, he had a very solid season. 27.7% strikeout rate, a 3180 ERA, a 338X FIP, 1.0 whip on the nose, a 12.3% swinging strike rate. Year before that was only six innings, so he's dead that year. Half a year this year, less than half a year last year, and last year just kind of fell apart uh, before succumbing to the injury. 6.65 ERA, a 4.83 XFIP. This is a lot better than that, but this on its own still isn't very good. And this is tragic. 18.9% strikeout rate down from the high 20s. Um, that's just a completely different guy. He also allowed a 5.52% home run rate, 10.4% barrels, 44.5% hard hits. All of this is problematic. Um, I really have very little expectation for Seve, but he does come through the model okay. Part of that is the Brewers lineup on the other side. Part of that is some historic, or not historic, but is some talent history. But I think we're closer to this guy than we are the 2022 guy, at least to get started. I need, I think we need to see it a little bit here. 7,700 is a fair price for that projection. 6,100 is definitely a fair price for that projection. I just don't know how much I really trust it. He's going up against a Brewers lineup that's got Christian Yelich in it. It's got a very good hitting catcher in William Contreras hitting second. Other than that, Reese Hoskins for power, but obviously some strikeouts there. Jake Bowers is very gettable for strikeouts. Oliver Dunn I'm not really worried about. Jackson Churio is a potential star, but he's a rookie playing his, what, second career game? Bryce Turang didn't really get anything going despite having a little bit of prospect buzz last year. Had a good camp and is supposed to be able to hit, but I don't know. Remains to be seen. So it's kind of a non-threatening lineup, which is, again, feeding that projection a little bit. But you could also couch this lineup as um, two very good talents, a reasonable mid-range power and speed guy, a home run only, a home runner or empty guy, another home runner empty guy, another home runner empty guy, but three fairly threatening power hitters. So there's multiple ways that you can set this Brewers lineup up to talk about it. Um, I'm not saying they're the real threat to Severino here. I'm just, I really do need to see the success before I really buy in, fully endorse it. It's there in the projection if you want it. Let's put it that way. If you've got faith in Sevy. It's there in the projection. I doubt that he's going to be overly popular. And that price on DraftKings, if he gets anywhere near that old strikeout rate, does have some upside. But that's all it is. If I'm rostering Brewers against him, which I think would be my chosen side if I was forced to pick sides in that matchup, I'd be looking strongly William Contreras, Christian Yelich, and then depending where you're playing, you know, you could straight line through just all five of these guys. I'd probably take Churio wrap them around to Contreras and Yelich, played as a three-man, 
or maybe grab two out of these three guys to add to that as a power bat. So like two of these three, Churio from the bottom, Contreras and Yelich as a five man. I think that would be my approach. Don't I, I don't dislike Sal Frillick. He's a low strikeout, high walk guy with a little bit of speed, a little bit of power. Um, but I don't think he's a priority here. Churio's the better talent. Worst spot in the lineup, but better talent. So big, big yes for DL Hall shares at a very cheap price. Um, succeed or fail, I think you just have to. I, I think you just have to play it. Um, playable Mets, more toward the top of the lineup, obviously, and playable Brewers, mostly the guys I was just talking about. None of the bats are priorities. I don't think you can you can call Pete Pete Alonso one offs if you want him a, a fair priority. Same with Fran, Frankie Lindor, maybe like the three man there is a bit more of a priority. If you're taking a ton of DL Hall shares, I do think it makes sense to maybe grab a couple hedge stacks of Mets. Let's move on from that one. So, again, just a lot of enthusiasm for that. Oh, you know what? I also wanted to check... uh... Orioles. Ah, come on, Baltimore. Colton Kowser is only 2,000, and I was hoping he'd be in the lineup, but they do not have him in the lineup again today. It's just annoying. We got Baltimore, Miami, Kansas City, and Cincinnati. And, of course, these are all different. And I didn't really think through that I'm not going to be able to update the projections on the site while I do this, but that's okay. At least those games all start late, and we've got the early ones in. Tigers on the White Sox. Kind of like the Tiger stack today going up against Soroka. I wrote about it in the article. Soroka has missed just a ton of time over the last few years. Didn't pitch at all in the show the last two years. Had some minor league run last year in AAA and uh, debuted back in 2018. Pitched basically a full season in 2019 for the Braves. Pitched like six innings in 2020. Missed all of 2020, 2021. Pitched in the minors in 2022, 2023. Um, uh, Made six starts in the show last year, 32 and a third. 20% strikeout rate. This is about where he was before all of the the nastiness. 6.40 ERA in the small sample, 4.69 XFIP. Allowed a ton of power upside. I just don't really see it yet for Soroka. He projects out okay, 6,700, 6,800, but I greatly prefer the Tiger side of this. I like the young left-handed bats that they've got in that lineup. I like Spencer Torkelson. I think there's good upside here for the Tiger stack. So I think I'm going definitely in that direction over Michael Soroka in a head-to-head, and I think that they could be a uh, an interesting stack for a fair price just in general for this nine-game slate. So no real love for the for any Soroka shares. Kenta Maeda? At 8,200, 8,400, projects in like the middle of the board. It's not far off of the uh, Soroka projection, honestly, but I like that spot a lot better. Made is a good pitcher, good over time, um, doesn't walk a ton of hitters, strikes out his fair share, 27.3% strikeout rate in 104 and a third last year, 4.23 ERA and a 3.98 XFIP, gave up a few too many home runs. Home runs go back and forth, um, but a little bit of barrel in there, a little bit too much exit velocity allowed. That can happen, and he could still succeed against this White Sox team. They're just a non-threatening group outside of uh, you know some Lou Bob and some Eloy Jimenez, maybe some Andrew Vaughn. It's a three-man team. These two guys, Joan Moncada never became what he was supposed to be. He's all right, but he's not anybody's idea of a good hitter. Andrew Benintendi is a light-hitting, contact-based uh, type guy. Fletcher, Shoemake, Nicky Lopez, Martin Maldonado down the bottom of this lineup. You can get through this lineup three times if you're Kenta Maeda and put up a decent strikeout total. So I like Maeda. He's just 8,200, 8,400. I wish he was priced like Soroka with that projection. That would make him a lot more valuable. But I think the prices are correct in the eights. Um, Just makes him kind of an awkward fit between he's not a top guy and he's not a value guy, which might also mean he gets lost in in the shuffle for the public a little bit. So I think there's good cause to get to some shares of Meta. Um, don't really like the White Sox stack all that much outside of the three-man right there. And even with that, 
there's a fair amount of strike out there. There's I don't love that option. Not a lot of support for them in the rest of the lineup. On the Tigers side, the stack that I do like, I think Parker Meadows is interesting hitting lefty as a uh, leadoff option. Three home runs, eight stolen bases in his 145 plate appearances last year, but a fair amount of upside and a fair amount of buzz as a toolsy kind of prospect, moderate power, good speed, um, could steal a solid handful of bases, get himself on base in front of these other guys. And he did have a 338 on base in the small sample last year. So there's reason to believe that he'll be a good table setter, if nothing else, for these guys. Those guys being Spencer Torkelson, who hit 31 home runs last year, rescued his career. 213 ISO, a 107 WRC+, plus, fantastic contact profile, a 14.1% barrel, 50.5% hard hits. Riley Green, a very good lefty hitter, 288, 349, 447 last year. Crater runs 19% better than average. Very, very solid hitter. Also hit the ball very hard, 46.6% hard hits, 11.3% barrels. I like the home run total to go up a little bit for Riley Green in a full season, and I think he's an excellent option here. Only 4,800, 3,000 across sites. Very well, easily priced. Kerry Carpenter, I like for the power upside. Hit 20 home runs and 459 plate appearances last year. Had uh, six in just 113 opportunities the year before that. So that was his uh, little cup of coffee. I think there's plenty of upside there. 10.2% barrel rate, 43.1% hard hits last year. We could go above 25 home runs in a full season for Kerry Carpenter this year and going up against a weak righty who gave up a ton of power last year in his small sample and doesn't really have a lot of great strikeout stuff. I think there's good upside for Kerry Carpenter. Second on the team at an 8.0 in the home run model behind Torkelson, who's at 9.92, just missed the magic number for Torque. If he had gotten over 10, I might have picked him today. Mark Hanna, reasonable veteran presence in that lineup, still knows how to get on base. 355 on base last year, a 111 WRC+, plus, just 11 homers and 11 steals, but a solid overall hitter. 2600 is a fair price, outfield and first base eligible on FanDuel. Not my top priority, I like Colton Keith a lot. 2400 very, very cheap on both sides. Second base on DraftKings, third base on FanDuel. Top prospect organizationally, one of the top prospects in baseball. Very good hitter at second base. Power um, is expected to do a little bit of everything at second base. So I like that option for cheap. Another lefty in the lineup there too. Makes him kind of interesting. Javi Baez kind of off to an okay start over just a couple games. Uh, stole a base, I saw. So maybe if Javi gets himself engaged with this you know, fun, young, up-and-coming team, decides he likes playing baseball again, maybe we get a little bit of the old Javi Baez coming back. Last year, just five, uh, last year made 547 plate appearances, hit just nine home runs, stole 12 bases, and was just completely uninterested in playing baseball. So I think there's a lot to like. In that Tiger stack, I didn't mention Carson Kelly, Zach McKinstry. They're a little bit lower end, but Kelly at 2,700, maybe you throw him into uh, some catcher shares. Didn't really do much in his 151 plate appearances last year, but he's cheap. I'll give him that. Anthony Taylor says, great call on Keith. Thank you. Lazy mofos. Outside of pitchers and catchers, most of the time, chalk in MLB is like 25% anyway. It's not like NBA or NFL where that number usually means almost double that. Yeah, um, totally with you. Yeah, you don't see guys owned at like, you know, 75, 80% in, uh, in MLB, mostly. Um, and it just functions differently, right? You know, they, those guys get owned that, uh, that highly for, uh, for a reason because they just mathematically become the best fundamental pieces of uh of the slate with the variance in baseball exactly like you're saying it's just all over the it's all over the place so that nothing mathematically becomes a quote-unquote sure thing pre-lock things look better than others and should be more popular than others but it doesn't work the same way mathematically yes benny this is my jaws mug Souvenir from uh, Universal Studios down in Orlando last year, or year before last. We took my niece to Disney World and Universal and so on and so forth. It was a family trip uh, two years, like 18 months ago in the fall. And I brought that back. Uh, Jaws is one of my favorite all-time movies, so I brought that back. Had to buy it, even at touristy prices. Corbin, over three and a half earned runs, plus 125, lock. Absolute lock. Nice. 
Benny Loves Jaws too. Yeah, again, one of my just all time favorite movies. I actually went uh, earlier this year. There was a uh, a play going around. Um, it was p- written and put together by Robert Shaw, the guy who uh, played Quint. Not by him; he's dead. Um, but by his son. Um, and it's basically like a little behind the scenes, the making of Jaws kind of thing. So there's a guy playing um, Richard Dreyfus. There's a guy playing, uh, what's his face? Uh, Chief Brody. Oh, God. Uh, Robert Scheider. And then there's a guy uh, playing uh, um, Shaw. Or, or, or Shaw's son plays him, and he looks exactly like his dad. Um, and the through line is like, you know, getting to the um, the Indianapolis speech, the famous speech that he makes about, uh, you know, the ship went down in 18 minutes thousand men went into the water that that whole speech about delivering the bomb um and they go through just like you know all this frustration in making the movie and everything and it's just really really clever cute well done play um uh, and the kid looks exactly like his dad sounds exactly like his dad it's amazing i say kid he's like a you know 50 year old man um but just really really nailed playing his dad and the guy they had for the other two you know kind of they don't look or feel as much like them, but as through the course of the play, like they're such good actors that like, they just, you know, become those two guys kind of. So it's really fun play for, if you're a Joe's fan, it's called, uh, the shark is broken. Anyway, little, little detour there. Uh, so white Sox total non-priority. If you're going there, maybe some Lou Bob one-offs. If you're going to, uh, stack them because you're a white Sox fan, I would look at these three and my next two would probably just be the two guys above them. No real priorities there. Uh, so made a, not a priority, but you can definitely play him. Made a playable. Soroka, big no. Tigers, bats, definitely yes. I like that stack, and they're not that expensive, so they're a good value stack. Whether you three-man it, whether you five-man it, I think it works both ways. Um, so Tigers, are I'm pretty enthusiastic about here. Angels, Orioles, Grayson Rodriguez, a little bit cheap, 7,900 on DraftKings. He's 92 on the FanDuel slate. Projects out pretty well going up against an Angels lineup that is, you know, Mike Trout, a couple reclamation projects, and a couple young guys. That's really all this lineup is. They've got Miguel Sano in there. He's dead minimum. He does have power upside if he's in the lineup today, but hasn't been a major leaguer in a couple of seasons and, you know, was a very high strikeout major leaguer when he was there, did hit some home runs. But he's very, very gettable in the seven spot if that's where he hits. Outside of Trout, Rendon doesn't even like playing baseball and hasn't been good at it in quite a while, even when he's on the field, and he's rarely on the field. Aaron Hicks does get himself on base. I do like Aaron Hicks. I don't hate him like we talked about yesterday, like some of these other other Yankees casts off and, uh, and players. I was a reasonable fan of Hicks, and it's just the injuries that always hurt him with the Yanks. Uh, but he does have a little bit of power upside, and like I said, can get himself on base ahead of Mike Trout but he's not a threatening individual player by any means. Taylor Ward is probably their second best player in this lineup if it's not Brandon Drury. Both of those guys have right-handed power. They're reasonable assets. 14 home runs last year for Taylor Ward on a partial season. 26 home runs for Drury last year, and he hit uh, 33 the year before. uh, Nope, excuse me. 28 the year before. Ward hit 23 the year before. So there's a little bit of right-handed pop there. Assuming those guys are in the lineup, Nolan Shaniel's an okay, interesting left-handed uh, young young player at first base. Logan O'Hoppy does have power, maybe as a sneaky catcher here. He had 14 home runs and 199 plate appearances. But Grayson Rodriguez is a premium top end pitcher. Um, he had a little bit of a rough start last year. Came back, got sent down for a couple of weeks. Came back up and was pretty lights out the rest of the way. 25% strikeout rate across the entire season, 4.35 ERA, 3.78 XFIP over 23 starts, 122 innings. At his DraftKings price, I really like it. I think he's playable at 9,200 on that FanDuel slate, but at 79 on DraftKings, put him together with DL Hall and you're off and running for cheap pricing at pitcher. That's an easy one too to go to in my opinion. Plenty of strikeouts available in this Angels lineup. I like the upside for Grayson here. Griffin Canning, I think, is also a good pitcher. He had an underappreciated season last year. I just really like this Orioles lineup. So I'm more on the Orioles side of this one. He doesn't project out great, but for the money, he's all right. 7,500. I could see Griff Canning succeeding in this spot. I really could. He had a 25.9% strikeout rate in 127 innings, 22 starts last year. 4.32 ERA to a 3.82 XFIP. 
Gave up a little bit in terms of hits and walks, but a 12.8% swinging strike rate is definitely solid. Gave up too much in terms of premium contact. 9.8% barrels killed him. 91 miles an hour of exit velo and 4.10% home runs. A little bit of realistic power potential coming back for the uh, for the Orioles on their side. But Cannon could find some strikeouts against this lineup. He could have a surprisingly decent start here. I just don't love his prospects for like winning the slate at these prices and not against this team. I'd rather grab some Orioles here. Gunnar Henderson, solid 11-11 uh, in, uh, in the home run model from the leadoff spot. Got to like that at 5,300, 3,500 at uh, shortstop. Third base eligibility on DraftKings. Scored 100 runs last year, hit 28 home runs, stole 10 bases. Creator runs 23% better than average at 234 ISO. Killer option from the left side. Good way to start a lineup, good way to start a stack. Adley Rutschman, best catcher in baseball. 687 plate appearances as a catcher primarily last year. 20 home runs, 120, uh, 127 WRC+. plus. Santander off to a good start. The other guy over the magic number for home run upside in this lineup. But we've got Rushman just under it. Mount Castle right at it. Even Ryan O'Hearn just a little bit under it. So some very, very good options for power upside. A couple of good lefties in that lineup. A couple of good switch hitters in that lineup today. Cedric Mullins hiding down here in the seven spot. Former 30-30 guy. Off to a good start for his season. Just 15 homers, 19 steals in a partial season, 455 plate appearances last year, and was not as good as he's been in years past last year when he was on the field. Only 99 WRC+. plus. Strong bounce back candidate if he's healthy. Jordan Westberg, a decent prospect in a, on a team that has, you know, if you're a decent prospect, you kind of fall by the wayside with this squad. But right now he's holding down this infield job. Um, Ramon Urias also getting infield time. They've got um, Jorge Mateo getting infield time, but they've got a big looming prospect in Jackson Holiday who uh, will be here very, very soon. For now, though, I do think Westberg's playable. Urias is sneaky playable with triple position eligibility for 25 on FanDuel. At 24, third base only, I don't love it nearly as much, but he's got a little bit of sneaky pop in his bat. Um, but really, we're looking one through seven here. Any combination of these guys, I think you can get behind. Ryan O'Hearn's season last year was kind of surprising. 368 plate appearances, 289, 322, 480, 14 home runs. It was a career year for him, but 51.5% hard hits, 10.1% barrel rate. I'm not convinced that he's going to come back and re-deliver this kind of a season, but he did have a 48% hard hit rate the year before. There is reason to believe that you know the way that they deploy him and platoon him a little bit, manage his spots. I think we could see some success, and he's very fairly priced, 3,400, 2,700. Going up against a righty who did give up power last year? Don't dislike that at all. So any combination of these seven guys, and if you need depth, you can go down one through nine on this lineup. Grayson Rodriguez, big yes. Oriole Stacks, big yes. Griff Cannon can succeed, but probably not the right day for him for uh, our purposes for DFS. No real love for the Angels outside of, you know, maybe some Trout or Trout Ward Drury like one-offs or maybe light use as a three-man. And maybe you throw Miguel Sano into that mix just because he is the dead minimum price. A flat 2,000 home run from anybody is always worth it. Good pitching matchup here. Braves and the Phillies. The only thing working against everybody, this is one of those games where it's all four corners could easily succeed. All four corners could easily fail because everything's good. Max Fried is good. Max Fried is good at limiting home run power. The Phillies are good at hitting home runs. But you can see Fried's impact on their home run numbers in the model here. The highest guy on the Phillies is Kyle Schwarber at 6.89. Schwarber's almost always at or above the magic number. And the rest of these guys dip. Nobody nobody else in this lineup even above five. So there's a big impact. Freed undercuts launch angle. He's very good at limiting barrels. Very good at limiting hard hits and power and home runs. Exit velocity. Decent strikeout pitcher. This is a 77 and two-thirds inning sample from last year over 14 starts. 2.55 ERA, a 3.10 XFIP with nearly a 26% strikeout rate and no real power against to speak of. And that's fairly sustained over time. Just a 4% barrel rate the year before, 1.64% home runs and 185 and a third. Struck out fewer, but similar ERA and XFIP numbers. Similar ERA and XFIP numbers the year before that with similar rates for power. Under 87 miles an hour of exit velocity on average in each of these years. It is difficult to hit home runs against Max Fried. It is difficult to get extra base hits and really drive the ball against Max Fried. Does he have his best stuff in uh, in his pocket today? You know, who knows? That's why we play the game. Don't know if he's going to come out and strike out 26% this year. We could see a little bit of a dip, but that's kind of accounted for um, because the projection is not even over 30. So 
while I do think he's very good, while I think he could have a limiting impact on the Phillies upside, I don't know that I go to Max Fried in this spot at 9,500, 9,100. And it's kind of the same for Aaron Nola, who I love on the other side of this game, 10-3, 9,900. The prices are just, you know, in the right spots for them in a vacuum for both of these pitchers without considering the matchup. Aaron Nola's got the worst matchup in baseball going up against the Braves today. He projects out fine, but not really for the money in compared to the rest of the guys on this slate. And then you get the, when you were talking about the, well, to round out Nola, 4-4-6 ERA was a little bit bumpy last year, but the 3-6-3 XFIP is a lot more indicative of who Aaron Nola really is. 5.7% walk rate, 25.5% strikeouts. Still very much Aaron Nola, still very much a top 12 pitcher in, uh, in all of baseball. I have no issues with going to Nola. I just don't like him at price in this matchup. Same thing with Freed. And then when we're talking about the bats, I absolutely love this Braves lineup but they are facing Aaron Nola. So there's a little bit of a ding potentially there. And I'm not, not going to look back over, you know, how they've done against Nola in years past or whatever. I just, it's kind of a wash. It's kind of happenstance. It starts getting into BVP territory. At the top of the board for the Braves, 6,500 for Ronnie Acuna is always worth it, even against Aaron Nola, 4,400 on the FanDuel slate, 41 homers, 73 steals, can't argue with the production, 10.88 in the home run model. You also get Olsen over the magic number at 10.47. If you are picking sides for hit, for hitters in this one, it's firmly on the Braves side, just given the power upside. Nola doesn't have that same uh, power limiting ability, he's just very, very good, uh, but 4.04% home runs last year, gave up some exit velo, gave up some barrels. You get uh, Austin Riley just under the magic number for home run upside. Marcelo Zuna hit 40 home runs and only cost 3,100, 4,600 across sites today. Michael Harris, uh, tragic start to his season, or a very bad start to his season, I should say. Rounded it up to 293, 331, 477 when it was all said and done. 18 homers, 20 steals. Had a great season last year. Travis Darno should be in this lineup. One of the better power hitting catchers in all of baseball just happens to be a backup, so he's always cheap. But anytime Travis Darno is in the lineup, you can pick him off for you know cheap upside as a catcher home run. Orlando Arcia, if he's playing, reasonable option for a cheap price at, at uh, shortstop. 17 home runs last year, kind of quietly. And then Jared Kelnick definitely has a little bit of a sneaky upside. Former top, top prospect has washed out of a couple organizations. If anybody's going to rescue him, it's these Braves, though. I like the upside for Jared Kelnick uh, for season long for Dynasty and as an oddball at a cheap price in that Braves lineup today. If nothing else, he helps you pay for these guys. He's not an ideal wraparound because he doesn't get on base a ton. So we're not talking about a guy who's going to set the table for these dudes, but it's just like a throw in. Another guy in this lineup, especially if you're building from the middle down, I think there's upside there. On the Philly side, Schwab's Turner, Alec Bohm, Bryce Harper all off the top. Very, very easy to get to any of them under normal circumstances. But again, with the power kind of capped artificially in this one, I don't love it. They could base hit Max Fried to death for sure. Some of them project out still fairly strongly. But it's not a great matchup for the Phillies upside. Um, you know, four five run game, sure. A 12-run game against Max Fried is less likely. Some good down lineup hitters in Nicky Castellanos, JT Romuto, still one of the better catchers in all of baseball. A lot of barrel rate for a lot of these guys. Tons of hard hits for the Phillies. Alec Bohm, if he's hitting third at 3,900, 3,200 between these hitters, by the way, is a nice piece of value in that stack. He hit 20 home runs, 105 WRC plus last year. Bottom of the lineup with Merrifield on this team now. A little bit of speed, a little bit of power in the mid-range, decent uh, bat-to-ball skills. Bryson Stott, similar uh, kind of a breakdown for him. He had 15 home runs, stole 31 bases last year. Fairly affordable at second base. So I like this Phillies team. I just don't like them against Max Fried in this spot. I think they could have an okay day in real baseball sense. DFS-wise for these prices against Freed without a lot of home run equity, I don't love we keep on rolling through this. I, I'm going to try and get us through because I do. I realize that I do need to uh, update those projections before this slate locks. So I'm going to try and get us out like, I don't know, 115 gives us another half hour to get through the rest of these games. Might be able to do that. 115, 120, somewhere on there. Lazy Mofo says, hello, the first time, first time I heard BVP all year. I forgot that was a thing. Thank you for mentioning it, though. Someone I know that wants to learn MLB. This convo hasn't come up yet, so I have to bring that up. Yes. Yes, for those uh, for the un unindoctrinated um, BVP, also known as uh, batter versus pitcher, individual batter versus pitcher matchups do not matter. Don't look at them. Don't consider them. Don't 
you could talk about them all you want. You could bring them up in the chat and they'll tell you not to worry about it. We can do that all year. Um, but they just don't matter. The sample sizes are nowhere near big enough, guys. Even when we're talking about a guy who's, you know, spent 15 years in baseball against a pitcher who he's faced in the same division over those 15 years, you still don't add up to enough plate appearances. Baseball takes a long time to normalize statistically. So you just, no matter what, you don't have enough plate appearances. Do guys own certain guys? Are there, you know, is there reason to believe that this guy sees the ball coming out of that pitcher's hand better than other guys, or he picked up something that the pitcher does with his elbow when he throws a curveball, so he always knows what's coming? Of course, those things do exist. They are impossible to quantify based on batter versus pitcher data. There's just not enough sample. There's way too much noise. So that's it. That's the BVP thing. Devers versus Cole BVP is being called out in the chat. There you go. I don't even know what it is. Is it good or is it bad? I honestly don't know because I never, ever look at it. I assume it's. I assume Devers owns, owns Garrett Cole, but I have no idea. I could see it going either way. They're obviously two dynamite players. Anyway, let me keep this thing rolling. Tanner Bybee, top overall starter on the entire slate. 9,700 on both sites, top overall projection. I know we just did this talking about um, Logan Allen, but Logan Allen is not the pitcher that Tanner Bybee is. Way lower strikeout potential. 142 innings for Bybee last year, 24.1% strikeout rate, a 2980 ERA, a 4.22 XFIP, 11.1% swinging strikes. Was pretty good at limiting power. Going up against a very limited athletics team. Uh, if this is the version of the Athletics lineup, they've got all kinds of different things they could do. They didn't even roll out Brent Rooker against the lefty yesterday, which was weird. Um, they'll probably go mostly lefty-oriented today with uh, some of these guys. So I like some of the lefties. Like, I like Noda. I think J.J. Blade is an okay lefty hitter. I think Seth Brown is pretty good. I like J.D. Davis from the right side. I think Zach Geloff's got good upside for 2020 or, or beyond, 25-25 this season. Um, but I just don't like this ace team. I, I think they're the opposite of um, a team like the Rays where like their parts are greater than the sum in, in certain ways. Like I think Zach Geloff on his own is a pretty good young player. I don't like this A's lineup just because he's in it. I think J.D. Davis is an underrated option for power. I talked about it yesterday. He went out and hit us two home runs yesterday. Didn't have him on any teams because I wasn't going to the, uh, to the athletic stack, but he did mash the ball. The reason I like J.D. Davis, I was talking about him through last year because two years ago, 16.2% barrels, 55.6% hard hits. It was in a part-time role, and he was just always struggling to find a full-time gig. Got 546 plate appearances with uh, San Francisco last year, and unfortunately the production dipped a little bit in that department. He still turned in 18 home runs, had a decent year, but I like the power upside from J.D. Davis because he's always cheap, but it doesn't make me really like this lineup. So there's a lot of that going on with the A's. I just think Tanner Bybee's got a really good shot to just own this team today. Um, similar path to success that we saw with uh, Shane Bieber on uh, the night slate on opening day. Bieber put up a 60 on the FanDuel point scale on, against this team. Similar kind of trajectory, similar kind of upside. Bybee's very expensive. I expect he's going to be popular on this slate. I just don't care. I think he's totally worth getting to. And that price doesn't matter if you're putting it together with D.L. Hall. It just doesn't matter. So easy, easy option on this slate. J.P. Sears projects out okay. I'm kind of surprised by it, but we had good games from Sears last year. He was kind of sneaky in spots last year. I'm not saying that he's good. I am saying that he's got a little bit of sneaky ability in the right spot. And part of that is based on an 11.3% swinging strike rate. With an 11.3, his CSW should have been way higher than 25.5%. Doesn't get enough calls in the zone. Still managed to strike out 21.9 over his 172 and a third. The ERA was 454. The XFIP was worse than that. That's where he's bad. And he gave up a lot of power, which is bad. So there's good and bad in here. Going up against the Cleveland team as a lefty, I do think there's a little bit of potential upside if he can just avoid Jose Ramirez. As long as you don't get yourself into trouble against Jose Ramirez, this is kind of a non-threatening lineup. There's not a lot of power in it. They are a station-to-station -station kind of a team. So 
I kind of think there's maybe sneaky upside here for, for Sears. I just wish he was like a $6,000 and change, 6900 even. Save me 600 bucks over that price on DraftKings. I don't think he's cheap enough to consider like a strong value, but he does project out all right competitively. I think if you ran him through a pure optimizer, he would come up a little bit here. Could definitely go pop boat. This is a low confidence one. Um, not a strong endorsement here. I don't think that necessarily leads to Guardian stacks in any real way. You can see it in the home run model a little bit, even against the guy who gave up a bunch. Nobody over even an 8, 7.23 for Jose Ramirez. He's a great player, 282, 356, 475 last year, 23% better than average creating runs, 24 homers, 28 steals. Not a lot of support in the rest of the lineup. I do like Josh Naylor. I do like his brother when he's in the lineup. He's not in this projected one. Nobody else in this lineup, really, though. Andres Jimenez would be the other guy, but he dips against the lefty, drops in the lineup. He's up here, usually, against a righty. So I don't love the lefty-lefty for, for uh, Jimenez. Not a lot to like here. So I'm not really stacking Cleveland. Not really stacking the A's. I love the Tanner Bybee spot. I think J.P. Sears has a sneaky path to success. I just don't think you necessarily need to take that risk. Across 150 lineups, sure, you could throw him in a few times. If you're building like one lineup, if you're building five lineups, I don't know that you need to go to JP Sears here. There's a lot to work with. Another big target on this one. The Reds lineup going up against Patrick Corbin. The ghost of Patrick Corbin. 5-2-0 ERA last year. 4.76 XFIP is no better. Give up 4.18% home runs on nearly 91 miles an hour of exit velo on the average. 9.3% barrel rate. This is over 32 starts. There's no small sample tragedy here. This is just who Patrick Corbin is now. I put it in the article. He accidentally ran over uh, the uh, wandering sorcerer in the middle of the night years and years ago. And that guy put a curse on him, kind of like in the movie Thinner. And he's just no longer a good pitcher. Patrick Corbin used to be really good. Then all of a sudden, he was really bad. And he's just been an absolute target for bats for the last few seasons. Nothing about that changes today. Uh, he's pitching in this killer ballpark. So I love, love, love the spot for this Reds lineup. Let's see who's in it. Jonathan India, Spencer Steer off the top. Like that a lot. Christian Encarnacion Strand. I love the home run upside for Encarnacion Strand. Ellie is in the lineup uh, hitting uh, sixth. Like that. Don't love the prices on Ellie, but there's so much cheapness around him in this lineup and there are cheap pitchers available today makes it really easy to get to him super toolsy if you're not familiar with ellie there are way too many strikeouts in his game there are a lot of holes in his swing there's a lot of work to be done for him to turn into the superstar that everybody's expecting him to be um, but even with all those flaws managed to hit 13 home runs still 35 bases and 427 plate appearances as a rookie last year and has just limitless ceiling i think third base and shortstop eligible at 36 this is actually not a, a terrible price the 57 is a little bit tough to reach on DraftKings, but again, with everybody averaging him down, even from the top of the lineup, it's easy enough to get to. 4,100 for Christian Encarnacion Strand's power is a joke. That is way too cheap. He's also got first and third base eligibility on DraftKings, which is fantastic. He's too cheap on FanDuel as well at 3,000. He had 13 home runs and 241 plate appearances in the show last year, added a bunch in the minors. Power for days from Christian Encarnacion Strand. I like that a lot. He's the only player on this team over the magic number for home runs. But Ellie's closing in on it. Uh, India and Spencer Steer are both closing in on it. I like Steer a lot. 23 homers, 15 steals last year. 118 WRC+, 192 ISO. Went 271, 356, 464 in 665 plate appearances. Multi-position eligible for a fair price on both sites. India, quality second base option. Heimer Candelario at third base for only 4,400 is another really strong option. He's 2,900 at third base on FanDuel. 8.38 in the home run model. Another guy just right below the magic number for home runs. 22 homers last year at 220 ISO in 576 plate appearances. Santiago Espinal is kind of an awkward fit in the middle of the lineup, but at least he's only 2,100 triple position eligible on the FanDuel slate. I just didn't expect him to be hitting fifth in the in the heart of the lineup here um that's more like what like let's get will benson in that spot even Stuart fairchild fairchild's kind of interesting 2800 2200 against the lefty um reasonable right-handed uh line drivey kind of a hitter 160 iso only five home runs last year and 255 plate appearances managed to swipe a few bases um i mentioned benson i don't love benson for the lefty lefty of it but 
if we don't think Corbin's going to be long for this game, that's one reason to consider Benson. And just we don't think Corbin is good. He's not exactly blowing guys away with the strikeout. So I'm not as concerned about a lefty-lefty here. And Benson's very cheap for his talent, 3,700, 2,800. 11 homers, 19 steals, and 329 plate appearances last year. Everybody in the industry likes him for 2020 and above this season. So really like the, the Will Benson spot, even from the bottom of the lineup. It potentially just makes him sneaky. The Nationals... I do think there's a little bit of potential power upside at the very least, just because, you know, ballpark plus some decent home run hitters. Joey Gallo, I think all you guys know by now that I love. Lane Thomas above the magic number. He had a very nice year, 28 homers, 20 steals with a 201 ISO last year. CJ Abrams has realistic power, 8.1 in the home run model. Joey Manessis at 8.3. Even Jesse Winker at 7.5, and he's very cheap. The thing that's working against all these guys is Hunter Green is a really good pitcher. 112 innings uh, last year, 22 starts, had a 4.82 ERA, but the XFIP was a lot cleaner at 4.01. Did walk too many hitters. That's his problem, 9.6% walk rate. We're not going to hide that. But he struck out 30.5% of opposing hitters last year as well. Give up a little bit of power, but I'm here for the strikeouts. I'm here for the swinging strike rate. 13.4% is just a dominant pitcher with a lot of room to grow. 1.42 whip is largely driven by that uh, extended walk rate. He had a few clunker starts, no doubt, last year. That's why he's only 8,500 on the DraftKings slate. That's another bargain pitcher. You can see his price on FanDuel, 10.8. That is a stark contrast from side to side. So it's difficult to reach him at 10.8 given the competition on that FanDuel slate. That said, it's kind of a crappy slate anyway. Only 10K to the in the biggest tournament, seven games on it. But uh, I love Hunter Green here at 8,500. I think he's competitive with Bybee for the top overall spot at that price. I really like it, and I think it's a good enough matchup. Um, get through the you know the power upside. There are plenty of strikeouts here. So I really like the spot for Hunter Green. That is my preferred spot uh, from this entire game, really. If I could only take one thing, I think it would be Hunter Green, uh, even over the red stack. But I love Hunter Green, love the red stack. No Patrick Corbin. Do not roster Patrick Corbin here. Even if he succeeds, it was a mistake to have, to have rostered him. Um, and then uh, minor, minor shares, particularly if you roster a lot of Hunter Green, take a few minor uh, hedge stacks of Nationals. If you take 25% Hunter Green across 150 lineups, make five lineups that have Nationals bats in them as, as a hedge. And those bats would be CJ, Lane Thomas. You can use Jesse Winker. He hasn't delivered much over the last couple of seasons, but he's very, very cheap. And he does have the idea of a lefty, a good lefty bat in there still. Joey Manessis and Joey Gallo would be, uh, so it would be like one, two, three, f- damn it, one, two, three, four, and then one of Winker, Kibert Ruiz, if you're playing on DK, or Eddie Rosario. Ildemar Vargas and uh, Luis Garcia, you can like kind of fall by the wayside. And that's not a priority by any stretch of the imagination, though. That is a hedge position. Uh, at best maybe you can one-off some of these guys just because of the ballpark and lineups that are not using anything from this game no hunter green no anything else sure you can grab a $2,500 joey gallo one-off if you if you want it $3,600 on uh on DraftKings. cj abrams is a very very good player 18 homers 47 steals last year you can fill shortstop with cj abrams as a one-off on essentially any given slate he's that kind of talent so red's big yes hunter green big yes let's keep on moving Travis Duarte stacked the Mets wraparound in Cincinnati with Ryan and Green. Left a thousand on the table. Morning, buddy. Yeah, I like that. I don't love the Mets because I like the DL Hall side, but I could definitely see them succeeding. Love the Cincinnati side. Really like Joe Ryan. Think Green's a good choice. Aggressive Goose says, come for the baseball breakdown, stay for the cheesy horror movie references. <laughs> Boy, you know the show well, my friend. Uh, here's Joe Ryan. So Ryan's 10-1 on the FanDuel slate, 9,300. Very affordable uh, for such a good talent on DraftKings. Kind of underappreciated, I think. He was a really good pitcher last year. 4-5-1 ERA kind of obscures his quality. 3.76 XFIP, only a 5.1% walk rate. 161 and two-thirds. He struck out 29.3% of opposing hitters. Gave up a little bit too much in terms of power. 4.76% home run rate is way too high, but say it with me, home runs are wonky. 90 miles an hour of exit velo, if we drop that by a tenth of a mile an hour, we're under our threshold. 8.7% barrel rate is acceptable if you know a few of them stayed in the park. 
five of those stay in the park and all this looks a lot better. So I don't really sweat the power with Joe Ryan that much. I love the strikeouts, the minimized walks. I like him to exceed these numbers basically across the board. 13.8% swinging strike rate is a dominant swinging strike rate. So yeah, absolutely. Like Travis Duarte said, fire up the uh, fire up the Joe Ryan shares, especially going up against a team like the Royals here. There are plenty of strikeouts available in this lineup. There's a couple guys who cut the average down, like 11.9% from Vinny Pascantino, who is a very good hitter in a, just in a vacuum. That 11.9 really helps lower the overall average. They've also got a couple non-threatening guys like Adam Frazier, Nick Lofton, and Kenny uh, Kyle Isbell. Kenny Isbell, where did that come from? Kyle Isbell at the bottom of the lineup, all below 20%. But the actual threats, the MJ Melendez, 28.2%. Sal Perez at 23.3%. He was 23% the year before. 22.3% from Michael Garcia. The only like two threatening hitters that are low strikeout are Bobby Witt and Vinny Pascantino. Bobby Witt improved from 21.4% to 17.4%. Still doesn't walk a ton. But I think Joe Ryan's got good strikeout upside here. I think Joe Ryan can handle this lineup perfectly fine without really breaking a sweat so even at the FanDuel price I don't mind it at all he does project out a little bit lower than some of the some of the uh, competition a little bit of that is because of the power track record from last year um, but definitely a similar ceiling if nothing else to uh, to those other guys if you happen to want to roster Royals for whatever reason it basically starts and ends with Bobby Witt as a one-off 6300 is very high price for a one-off though 3800 on the FanDuel slate if you want to stack them, my next man in would probably be Pascantino, then Sal, and then MJ, just straight down the line there, and probably Hunter Renfro after that. Michael Garcia did homer the other day, 272, 323, 358 last year. 0.086 ISO last year, though, 16% worse than average creating runs over 515 plate appearances. I don't really think there's a lot to see. He did have a 50.6% hard hit rate, which is very good. Very few barrels. No barrels the year before. Maybe just more line drive oriented. I got to see a little bit more of Michael Garcia before I make a decision about him. But uh, right now, no real priority. He's very cheap. So if you're snapping together Royals for, for whatever reason, especially on FanDuel, he does help average down that uh, Bobby Witt salary, if nothing else. But not so on DraftKings and not really a priority. Hunter Renfro is a very good right-handed power bat. 20 home runs last year was a big dip. Um, he was he hit 60 over the two Two years combined before that, 29 and 31 going back in time. So still a good right-handed power option from uh, Hunter Renfro. And then these three guys are just total afterthoughts for DFS. On the twin side, going up against Seth Lugo, I like their upside today. Byron Buxton over the magic number for home run power. A couple guys at or about, you know, a couple high sixes, a 7.45 from uh, Carlos Correa, Max Kepler at 8.11. He hit 24 home runs in 494 plate, 491 plate appearances with a 224 ISO last year. Max Kepler's a very good left-handed power hitter, and he's not priced appropriately. 3700 on DraftKings, 2900 on FanDuel is a very good price for Kepler. Byron Buxton, probably not expensive enough for his talent. His biggest issues is, are staying on the field. He never found consistency last year in his triple slash. But he still managed 17 home runs in his 347 plate appearances, 9 stolen bases, a 230 ISO. He's a star talent if he's just consistent and healthy. It's all we, all we ever lack for him. But I think DK lowered his price a little bit too much. Makes him interesting here. Uh, Edward Julian in the top spot, 3,200 is too cheap for him. 2,900 on FanDuel. He hit 16 home runs and 400 plate, plate, 408 plate appearances last year as a rookie. A 195 ISO creator runs 36% better than average. I like that as well. Um, stacking those four guys. Plus, you've got options in Carlos Santana with a little bit of power and a decent bat. Matt Wallner with a lot of power from the left side and only 2,700, 2,900 across sites I really like. Jeffers, Kirilov, even Willie Castro down the bottom of the lineup. This lineup plays one through nine in this form and a lot of other forms that it might be taking. Let's see if we got it yet. Nope, hasn't been confirmed yet. I know some of these lineups that we're talking through are not necessarily matching the currently confirmed lineups. I can only do so many things at once, and I decided to jump on and do a show. Um, for those looking for projections, I will uh, be out of here soon enough that we'll get them updated before lockdown. Um, so I think you can stack Twins um, predominantly because Seth Lugo, if for the quality they put up last year, is still not a great pitcher by any means. Give up a lot of barrels, 
a lot of exit velo, managed to cut that at 3.15% uh, home runs. But remember, a lot of that action was in San Diego. 3.57 ERA, 3.76 XFIP. I'm not saying he's bad, but I don't think he's as good as maybe the run numbers indicated last year. Still had a 1.20 whip despite only a 6% walk rate, only a 9.9% uh, swinging strike rate, 27.7% CSW. Kind of belies his 23.2% even strikeout rate. So I think Lugo's all right. But I wouldn't use him for DFS here at 85, 83. And I think it feeds some upside for the Twins. So I kind of like the Twin stack. Joe Ryan, big yes. Twin stack, moderate yes, and a good option for a value stack because nobody's all that high priced. And you get a couple really good players at a discount. And then really nothing from the Royals for me. Two games to go. You say Kikuchi, I think could be kind of interesting here. He projects out fairly well. He's always been a good strikeout pitcher. He's got his issues with home runs. He went from being a target to being a question mark to being back to a target to being I don't know what. Um, he's all over the map historically. You can see the absolute disasters in his home runs and his power that he allowed these two years, 2022 and 2021. And I believe 2020, I want to say, the short season was also really bad, if I'm remembering correctly. 5.07% uh, home run rate in 2022 off a 47% hard hit rate and 14.8% barrels. That's just ridiculous. Year before that was 4.05% home runs on similar 47% hard hits, 11% barrels. He cleaned a lot of that up last year. It's still high at a 90.5 mile an hour average exit velo, 9% barrels, but he managed the home runs a little bit, 3.86. You know, maybe some of that's happenstance. It works in both directions, obviously, with home runs being a little bit back and forth. Um, but this was a much better year in terms of allowing the power. Struck out nearly 26%, put up a 3.86 ERA, 3.77 XFIP, 12.2% swinging strikes. I like his strikeout upside. He's going up against a lineup that has a fair amount of strikeouts in it. A couple guys under 20% that are good at limiting strikeouts, but a couple very high strikeout guys that give it right back. So I like the strikeout upside for Kikuchi. I don't think he's going to be all that popular. I didn't look at the ownership, but at 8,100 on DraftKings, I think he's worth taking a few shots on. 8,900 on FanDuel, you can get there on that seven-game slate if you want to. On the Rays side, I would not roster Zach Littell. 19.5% strikeout rate last year. It's not bad in 90 innings, 14 starts. A 3.2% walk rate is downright good. 4.10 ERA, 4.15 XFIP. Give up a little bit of power. I just have no real faith. Doesn't project out well, 6,900, 6,500 against what I do think is a good Blue Jays lineup that just had a weird year where everybody last year basically underperformed. I think this Blue Jays team could bounce right back and be a force this year. Vladdy Guerrero, the overall home run pick of the day, the highest overall mark in today's home run model at 13.8. Why not choose Vladdy for a long ball today? Only hit 26 last year in a down season, only a 179 ISO. One of the key guys that needs to bounce himself back. George Springer also had a down year. 21 homers, 20 steals is still good total output for counting stats, but he's better than that. The triple slash was down, the ISO was down, the run creation was down. Bo Bichette in the triple slash, 306, 339, 475, pretty good. Only 168 ISO, 20 home runs, 125 WRC+, plus, but only five steals. He's got room to improve as well. Justin Turner's just a very good veteran aging hitter at 4,500, 2,900. The only thing that sucks, like I've talked about the last couple days, and I'm hoping they change, positional blocker with Vladdy on uh, DraftKings. No issue with that on FanDuel with the util spot, plus he's got first and third on FanDuel. Dalton Varsho, a little bit of pop, a little bit of speed from the left side. Um, didn't deliver what the Blue Jays or fan fantasy owners were looking for last year. Still managed to come up with 20 home runs and 16 steals, 14% worse than average creating runs. But he could pull things together. He had a much better year the year before. On the other hand, Kirk, Kevin Kiermaier, Isaiah Kiner, Falefa, Kevin Biggio, kind of a weak bottom uh, third of the lineup there with those four hitters. You can get a little bit out of Kirk. On the right day, you can get a little bit out of Kevin Biggio. Everybody knows I don't like IKF at all. Kiermaier is mostly here for defense. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't love that bottom end. Maybe they roll out something a little bit different. Do we get this one confirmed? But given all the talent up at the top, you know, top five at the very least, I think you can stack your way through that top five a number of times in this matchup. So I like the Blue Jays side. And then I do like the Rays a little bit for some uh, home run potential. Like I'm not completely sold that Yusei Kikuchi has gotten all those problems out of his game. So you can see Isaac Paredes there. He was a tempting pick for the home run pick for the, of the day at 10.07. 
hit 31 last year with a 238 ISO. Um, only an 18.2% strikeout rate for him as well with all those home runs is pretty solid. So you like the upside for Isaac Paredes. He's not terrible like uh, Jose Siri for the strikeouts at 35.7%. Rene Pinto at uh, 32.4 with a little bit of catcher upside. Six home runs in just 105 plate appearances. The reason I mentioned Siri, he had 25 home runs in just 364 plate appearances last year. Stole 12 bags at a 272 ISO. Created runs above average but was weak in the triple slash in terms of the average, the on base percentage and struck out a ton without making it up with walks. So he's one of the strikeout targets in here. John Diaz off the top, doesn't strike out, walks a lot, hits home runs, gets on base, hits for average, does everything. He is a star. Top two guys would be stars on any team. The rest of these guys are a, the parts, the sum exceeds the, uh, the total exceeds the sum of the parts, et cetera. However you say that you guys know what I mean. I do like Howard Ramirez for his line drive skill. He also excels against left-handed pitching. So there's upside for Howard Ramirez if he's hitting third in this lineup at 2,600, 4,100. I think he can get there. Not a big home run threat, but went 313, 353, 460 last season. Created runs 28% better than average. Did manage 12 home runs and is a very just good hard hit uh, guy. Um, just, you know, doesn't, uh, doesn't tend to elevate the ball. You can see that in the barrel rates at 4.6 and 4.8%. Solid line drive hitter, solid table setter for the guys behind him. Ahmed Rosario, if he's in the lineup, is potentially a little bit sneaky. Hasn't really ever put it together to the um, level that prospect forecasting had him at coming up, but had a couple decent seasons with double-digit home runs, double-digit steals. 11-13, 11-18 two years ago. Last year, it kind of cratered in uh, Cleveland. Six home runs, 15 steals. Found himself in Tampa Bay. But now he's just one of these Tampa Bay reclamation projects. Now he's one of these Tampa Bay, boy, that guy was supposed to be good, whatever happened, and now he's good on Tampa Bay, holy shit. And he plays, you know, every other day or whatever. I kind of like the upside for Ahmed Rosario this year. So maybe sneaky if he happens to be in the lineup. Uh, I mentioned Pinto just as a uh, cheap, easy-to-get-to catcher with a little bit of pop. And then whoever else is in the Rays lineup put together with uh, the other guys in the Rays lineup. I do think you can go there for a little bit of upside, but... And I can't believe I'm saying this. I actually think I prefer the Kikuchi side of that head-to-head. So, Blue Jays bats are a yes. Kikuchi is a yes with a little bit of an asterisk from just a, boy, we've gotten burnt making that play a bunch of times before in the past because of those home runs. Um, and then minor shares of race stacks, especially as a hedge if you take a lot of Kikuchi. Last game up, Pirates, Marlins. I like going back to the Pirates well here. Going up against Ryan Weathers, a nothing starter. 12 starts last year, 57 and two-thirds innings. 16.7% strikeouts with 11.3% walks. We can take advantage of that, I think. 6.55 ERA, a 5.56 XFIP. He also allowed a 4.67% home run rate. Just 9.2% swinging strikes, an awful 1.68 whip. He's not going to be in this game long. He's in the rotation to start the season because... Uh, Jory Perez, Braxton Garrett, et cetera, et cetera, down the line for the Marlins are all banged up to start the season. Um, probably when Braxton Garrett returns in two weeks, he's not going to be in the rotation anymore. But definitely targetable here in my mind. Connor Joe off the top is pretty cheap for a right-handed hitter who is a pretty good right-handed option against bad left-handed pitching. 3,400, 2,300 at first base and outfield on both sides really makes Connor Joe work here. Brian Reynolds above the magic number at 11.3 for a home run today. Really like him. Even at 5,000 on DraftKings, Arguably cheap, at least in this matchup. Maybe not overall for Brian Reynolds, but it's cheap for this spot. 24 home runs, 12 stolen bases last year. I like the upside for Reynolds. You guys know I love Cabrian Hayes. He's off to a very good start. 4,300, 2,900 across sites. 15 homers, 10 steals last year. Had a good night last night. Good start to the season. I really like him as a three-hitter. A lot of hard hits. If he starts elevating the ball just a little bit more, those are going to turn into a good amount of home runs. I really like his upside for like a 20 two to 25 home run and 18 to 22 stolen base kind of a season mccutcheon solid veteran presence gets on base killer table setter if you know if, even if everything else goes away from McCutch this year and he only hit 12 home runs stole 11 bases last year he's still going to be a good correlation piece just getting himself to first base Edward Olivares, playable 12 homers 11 steals in 385 last year for a fair price henry davis it's been fun to watch the uh the position stuff on dk Today, he's a catcher only. Yesterday, he was catcher and outfield. The day before that, he was outfield only. So at least they've got him correctly set for stacking this team. 
at catcher. 3100 pretty good price for a young uh, up-and-coming catcher with a very highly regarded bat. Catcher and outfield for only 2800 on the FanDuel slate. Easy enough to get to. O'Neill Cruz, very, very expensive, but everybody else in this lineup helps you average down these two prices. So you can stack him, Reynolds, and three other guys and get to a very good average per player price. No problem with it. Over the magic number for a home run today, 10.78 in the home run model. He was another tempting one to pick. Uh, only made 40 plate appearances last year. In 361 as a rookie of the year before, 17 homers, 11 steals, pretty solid. And just tremendous expectations. Uh, him and Ellie, just all the raw talent in the entire world. A lot of holes in the swing still, a lot of flaws, but both of those guys, potential superstars. And then our guy, Michael A, down the bottom of the lineup. Got to mention him every time. 21 homers out of the nine spot last year. That's all we're looking for for him is a 1% owned $2,500 home run here and there. You don't go to him. You don't prioritize him. You don't make him a part of your plans. But if you happen to be at the end of a lineup with only 2,500 in an open outfield spot, he's a guy you can click in. 223 ISO last year in 388 plate appearances. All right, uh, Jared Jones. Jared Jones is making his MLB debut. He's the Pirates number either three or five, I can't remember, an odd number up toward the top of their organizational prospect list. Um, highly regarded uh, right-handed pitcher. We'll see what he's got. This is the first time he's pitching in the show. 7,400 on DraftKings, 6,300 on FanDuel. Debuting against the Marlins, you could do worse for a debut opponent. Uh, his minor league numbers, I believe, are in the article that's up on the website, the strategy article, if you want to check that out. I'm just running out of time here. Um, but again, highly regarded kid. Um, he's no Paul Skeens. Skeens isn't here yet, but uh, we'll see what this guy's got. He is at least very cheap. I just don't think I go to him. Doesn't really project out well. The model knows everything about him. So didn't really land there. Luis Arias from the top of the Marlins lineup. Excellent on base hitter. Excellent hit tool. Great at getting himself to first base. Needs help from his friends to really deliver for MLB per, uh, for MLB DFS purposes because he doesn't hit home runs. He doesn't really drive them in. So needs to get on base and then needs to be driven in. Josh Bell, Brian De La Cruz, Jazz Chisholm, Jake Berger all have pretty good power. Any one of those guys could hit a home run, bring in the guys in front of them. It's a reasonable five-man group here. They're all fairly priced. Average price for the top five guys on DK is just 4300 so I do think against a rookie making his debut, you could go to this Marlins stack. You could throw uh, Jesus Sanchez in there for very cheap at 3000 He's got home run upside. You could throw Timmy Anderson in there. He's off to a decent start over the first couple of games. He's very cheap still and a former you know, 300 uh, hitter with decent power, decent speed. Nick Gordon, Christian Bethancourt off the bottom. Not overly wild about, but moderately playable if you're stacking this team. They're at least cheap. They at least help bring the price down. But I think the focus is one through seven, and the real focus is one through five if you're stacking this team. They're not a top priority team by any means. You can see nobody over the magic number for home runs. We've got 7.69 and 8.65 for Jazz to lead the team and an 8.27 for Berger. Berger hit 34 last year. We'll see what he brings back coming back around this year. But he had a 268 ISO, was very, very good for power last year. Jazz missed half the season, still came up with 19 homers, 22 steals, a 210 ISO. Really like that player. 3,300, 5,100, probably too cheap on FanDuel. DraftKings about right. FanDuel, probably a couple hundred bucks too cheap. I think you can stack Marlins. I don't know if you need to. You definitely don't want Ryan Weathers. I think you probably should stack some Pirates. If you're building uh, you know, more than a couple lineups, I think Pirates are definitely on the board, and they're very cheap. They work as a nice value to get you to expensive stacks expensive pitchers and jared jones i don't think i would go there i do think he's got talent i do think he could beat this marlins team over you know five innings or whatever post a handful of strikeouts i just don't think we're there yet so i wouldn't go that way yes i think hall is better than the puck play i don't i'm not saying that dl hall in this form is a better pitcher than aj puck but I am saying that D.L. Hall in this form for 4,600 on DraftKings is definitely a better play than A.J. Puck was yesterday. I didn't like the A.J. Puck play yesterday. We talked about that on the show. I was not on A.J. Puck yesterday. Um, didn't think it was going to go that badly. And, you know, another one that I was on that completely failed was Joe Musgrove. So, you know, these things, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of failure through with these uh, with these projections, predictions, anything I say on the show, it's going to be a lot of failure. That's part of it. But that was also, like I said at the top, one of the reasons I wanted to jump back on today was I was pissed off about where we landed on Pavetta, Bobby Miller, Joe Musgrove in particular, a couple of guys that just didn't get women, get where I wanted them yesterday. So, uh, But A.J. Puck was one of the ones we got right. Dale Hall, hopefully going to be one of the ones we get right today, but 
even in a vacuum, even if he completely fails, it was the correct play to, to play that price. 4,600 is just cheap. It's, it's a free square. With that, guys, let me punch out 121. We've got a start coming up uh, very soon, and I got to throw a quick projections update up on the site. So I'm going to jump off of here. Great having you today on a Saturday for a surprise show. This was fun. Uh, good luck out there today. Somebody go win something. Almost definitely no show tomorrow, but we'll definitely be back on Monday. I'll see you guys.